Thank you so much for joining in this important and timely discussion. My name is Dan Barkowiak. Again, I serve as Director of Communications for Pennsylvania Family Institute. It is my privilege to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Kevin Sabet. Uh, of his many accomplishments, Dr. Sabet has a new book coming out soon that we'll tell you all about. In that new book, uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who helped found Smart Approaches to Marijuana, shares how Kevin's record in fighting the disinformation campaign regarding this addictive drug of marijuana is unparalleled. And I certainly agree. You know, Dr. Sabet, to his credit, to his leadership of the national nonprofit organization Smart Approaches to Marijuana, you know, he's become the nation's leading voice on the harms of commercializing this drug. And I very much appreciate his leadership. His organization has been very helpful to us as an organization in Pennsylvania, to many across the country that are really looking to highlight the truths and the realities of today's marijuana. So he also served as White House Drug Policy Advisor to three different administrations. NBC News called him the prodigy of drug politics. He has a monthly column on Newsweek. The, the next hour plus is, is going to be well worth your time. So Dr. Kevin Sabet, just to, to highlight what we'll be doing, uh, he will be presenting to us some of the latest developments and more about his book. And we'll follow that up with a time of Q&A. So certainly if you have some questions, we welcome you to submit those uh, during the Q&A time. We had many that submitted questions ahead of time. We will try to cover as much ground as we can, but certainly welcome you to engage those that are watching live to submit questions during the Q&A session. So with that, Dr. Sabet, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Welcome, thanks for joining. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dan and, and Emily. Thank you for your help. And really, I want to thank the Pennsylvania Family Institute for just being so willing to engage in this conversation with regards to marijuana. It's not always the popular thing to do right now, but uh, if you believe in science and you believe in public health and you believe in um, making sure our kids have a chance and you believe in giving vulnerable communities uh, also an equal chance to, to make it in this world, uh, then you are on the side of what the Family Institute and what Sam, my organization, is trying to do, which is educate people um, on the harms of marijuana and really inform decision makers uh, on the implications of the policies that they are uh, considering. Um, Pennsylvania as a state means a lot to me, although I didn't um, grow up there when I was uh, in early in college my uh, in California, my parents moved to Pennsylvania. And so it's been home for me, actually. It's where I go home for really the last 20 plus years without without aging myself here, but around 20 years. Uh, and um, it, it, the, the state means a lot to me. It's been disheartening to see um, some of the things coming out of leadership, uh, which is very, um, I think some of them know better, uh, maybe not all of them, but I think some of them know better. And uh, that's why I think actually Pennsylvania is just so key right now in this greater discussion. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be on with you again. Dan has just been tremendous on social media and giving opportunities on this issue because I know this isn't the only issue. Obviously, um, the Family Institute is, 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 is dealing with many, many issues right now. And of course, this is a very special week, obviously, as well uh, for many, many of us, too. And so I just really appreciate the opportunity here. And I'm happy to, to start here. I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to um, definitely take some questions here. So let me just go ahead and start. Great. So uh, I'm going to be talking about marijuana issues. All of the information I'm sharing today, most of it is on our website, which is learnaboutsam.org. I'll share that URL later. Uh, and I also want to invite those who would like to register. If you're interested and you like what you heard today, we're going to have a wonderful jam-packed summit uh, online, a virtual SAM Summit, Friday, April 9th. We're co-hosting it with the National Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin Summit, which is the largest national conference on drug issues. Uh, and you can email Brendan at learnaboutsam.org to really get more registration info. A little bit about us at SAM. Uh, as Dan mentioned, we were founded by former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, as well as David Frum, who worked in the Bush administration, and myself, and I worked in, in a couple different administrations. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization. We have a leading scientific advisory board. So really everything we say and do has been vetted by the scientific advisory board. Uh, and we obviously stay very engaged in the press. We work with all the major medical associations, um, education groups, uh, you know, family groups, of 
course, um, business groups, medical authorities, prevention, all different groups. And so if you're you know, involved in a, in a sector that you think um, you know, this is related to, we would love to talk with you. We'd love to work with you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of one reason I'm really excited this year, because my book, my, the second book I, I've written, uh, it's called Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know. Uh, is going to be coming out on April 20th. Uh, and for those that can, we appreciate, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in buying the book, all the proceeds go to the, our nonprofit, Sam. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the book later. I, 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 I moved around the slides a little bit so that we could talk a little bit about the issue first. And, you know, when you talk about, I'm going to talk more, I'm going to talk both about policy and science. So we're going to get both. Um, and there are really three separate issues here that often get conflated that we need to separate out, although they're very much related and sometimes they're used interchangeably on purpose, sometimes they're used interchangeably to confuse us, but in reality they are three separate issues. The first is this issue of penalizing users, or you might call decriminalization, you know, putting people in prison, giving them a criminal record or some kind of record for, for using a small amount of marijuana generally is what you would say. The second one being the medicinal use of compounds derived from marijuana. So there are FDA approved medications, uh, a couple of them that have been approved um, by, the, by the Food and Drug Administration for use for specific ailments and illnesses. You have to get a prescription by a doctor. It's not a pot shop. You don't go, I know in Pennsylvania, in fact, in uh, near where my parents are near Philadelphia, I know they've opened some of these, but it's not, I'm not talking about the ones from the marijuana stores. I'm talking about from pharmacies, legitimate pharmacies. And now within one and two here, buckets one and two, there are many shades, um, some good, some not so good in my mind um, of what you could do there. But, but those are separate issues. Now, of course, we know the medicinal use has often been used as a Trojan horse for full legalization, no doubt about it. But I would call that the improper medical use. So the proper medical use would be the FDA approved meds. Um, and then this third bucket, which is the legalization of marijuana for non-medical use, really the kind of discussion that is being had by a few people in Harrisburg, as well as obviously just happened in New York today. Uh, and so that is really kind of one of the key issues that we are hearing a lot about, obviously, is legalization. I'm going to go through that a little bit. Why does this matter? Let's back up a little bit. Why do we care? Does it matter? People, do people use? Well, in the last 30 years, the regular daily use, heavy use of marijuana has skyrocketed in this country. Um, the share of past month users who actually use it not, not once a month, but every day is up to about 40%, which is much more than the share of alcohol users who use every day. Uh, and we now have 10 times as many daily users than we did in 1992 of marijuana. Over 9 million, that's probably now a low number, I'd say it's over 10, of those who use every single day. So this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. That's why we work with all kinds of organizations to get the word out. But the main thing here is that the kind of marijuana we're talking about is not your Woodstock weed, right? It's not um, what you think about, what many people think about. I bet, frankly, what Governor Wolf thinks about when he thinks about marijuana, it's probably this, you know, the stuff he saw in college, the stuff is he thinks, you know, he, you know, whatever his kids' friends used or whatnot. This is the kind of marijuana that many people, I mean, I wouldn't blame him for thinking of it because many people think of it like this, but that's actually not the marijuana of today. That's old, what I call old marijuana. This is new marijuana. Uh, it's the edibles, the elixirs, the candies, the sodas, the vaporizers, the blow torches, the, um, uh, the oils, the waxes, the, 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 the dabs, the capsules. You know, when I think most Americans would see this picture, they would have no idea what drug it is. I don't think they would guess marijuana. But today, we're seeing up to 99% THC. And, you know, I know a lot of young people often and other people. I mean, I, again, I wish I could say it was just young people. It's not. It's frankly a lot of our a lot of the people we really should be looking up to. They say, "Oh, it's just a plant." You know, why are you worried about a plant? Well, um, first of all, it's not just a plant because it's being totally changed. But secondly, even in the plant form, I mean, not all plants are good for you, right? I mean, poison ivy is not something you want to tell people to use, and that's just a plant. Opium is a plant. Opium poppy. I mean, so I mean that the, a lot of these arguments they just don't hold water. They're not scientific. Um, and unfortunately, they're gaining ground because people, 
we're in a period of our society right now where drug use generally is just becoming much more acceptable, whether it's marijuana, whether it's hallucinogens, whether it's obviously the opioid issue. Um, we were very happy to see the former Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, say, this isn't your mother's marijuana. The marijuana of today is significantly more potent. But it's not just Republicans and Jerome Adams. It's also, this is President Obama and President Biden's Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, who said that public policy is outpacing the science when it comes to marijuana. We, what we know is that marijuana is in fact addictive and he's right. In fact, yesterday a study came out or actually two days ago, a study came out showing that marijuana among young people was twice as addictive than alcohol or cigarettes. That's an incredible number. That's a number that we have never seen before. It was a huge study conducted by the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, and it's something we're very concerned about. We also know that the reason young people are, specific, are, are, are very uh, affected is that we have cannabinoid receptors located throughout the brain and body. And so THC, when you consume THC, um, it binds to these receptors all over the brain and body. That's what makes you high, right? That's what actually, you know, movement, sensation, vision, judgment. And then this thing called reward and memory in the central part of the brain. What is reward and memory? Reward and memory is essentially the building blocks of addiction. Addiction is when you really liked something, you remember you liked it, and you wanted to do it again. That is what we're talking about. It's key in addiction. That's why it's not surprising that we see one in three people who used marijuana in the last year total have what we call a cannabis use disorder, That's, which is an addiction. The cannabis use disorder is an addiction. And when brains that are not fully developed start using, like those under 25, um, they have a much greater chance of being addicted than those who are older. That's why if we can delay use until after age 25, you're, you're, you are very unlikely to become um, a habitual user or become addicted. Um, right now, you know, it's interesting, this generation of young people, when it comes to alcohol, cigarettes, um, I mean, even heroin, I mean, heroin and methamphetamine users are not usually 14 years old. That's not how it happens at all. Um, but when it comes to the, the drugs that they are using, like cigarettes and alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes and alcohol have actually been greatly reduced. We've had a huge downward trend. Cigarettes, because, you know, we've done a really good job, actually, talking about the harms of cigarettes um, and even alcohol. And yet for marijuana, that's not happening. We're seeing marijuana reduce that downward trend. In fact, if you look at daily users among high school seniors, 12th graders, marijuana is the highest. It's higher than alcohol, which is really only happened, um, you know, usually they were a lot closer together and then now they're really separating. And cigarettes had happened in 2015 where you had more people using every day marijuana than even cigarettes. So the, marijuana is a new, a new phenomenon now when it comes to this. Um, that's why we see the prevalence of addiction in children 12 to 17 has increased 25% after recreational marijuana legalization. That's a massive study in JAMA psychiatry. It's a very important one. Um, vaping is another issue that you might have heard about where a lot of people were being um, sent to the emergency room and um, a lot of issues two years ago, it's still happening. We're just not hearing about it. Um, and a lot of that is THC marijuana vaping. In fact, 80% of these cases that went led to the emergency room had to do with marijuana vaping, not e-cigs of regular um, tobacco. And so we're seeing this increase in past year, past month use. In any state that's legalized marijuana, we're seeing increases in youth use. And it's really important to understand that people try and downplay it. But we are seeing increases in these states. And in legal states, we're seeing very big increases versus non-legal ones. Um, surveys have shown that a quarter of high school seniors would use more if it was legalized. They admitted that. So imagine what would actually happen. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons we care a lot about this is because we know a lot more about marijuana than we used to. And we know that when you look at major large studies done, this one was done in England internationally, we found that regular high potency marijuana users were five times more likely to develop psychosis than um, 
but then low than 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 those who did not use, and three times more likely, even with lower potency marijuana, to develop psychosis. That's an incredible number. That's a factor we do not see in other drugs. Um, this has been replicated in study after study after study. Users of high potency marijuana four times more likely to abuse marijuana, twice as more likely to develop anxiety disorders, um, much less likely to complete high school or have a high university entrance score. In fact, um, marijuana users that do complete high school still do very poorly on university entrance tests versus non-users. This is really, really, really important to understand how this is affecting so many other things in our society. Um, it, and, and one of the reasons this is happening is this is associated with lower IQ. We are seeing those who use three to four times a week in their adolescence essentially have a eight point reduction in IQ. And that is an incredible number. Eight points is very, very high. Um, study after study, here's a study of veterans that just happened in the clinical psychology journal showing that marijuana use among vets was associated with negative outcomes like other substance abuse, worsening psychiatric disorders, self-harm, uh, and marijuana abuse by youth with mood disorders were linked to suicide attempts, self-harm and death, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the, the, we know this is something that is hurting our kids and really our general population, actually our elderly population, because elderly folks think that they could use marijuana to help them with aches and pains. And we're actually seeing a lot of negative, negative effects from that as well. Um, but you know, when people say marijuana doesn't kill you, to me, that's about as um, you know, sensical as saying cigarettes don't kill you. Just because you don't die of an overdose like you do with opioids, doesn't mean that it can't kill you. Suicide, driving, those are two ways, impaired driving and suicide, that it does kill you. And it is killing people, especially our young people. And you know, obviously cigarettes kill people through lung cancer. It's also indirect. You don't die from cigarette overdoses. Um, but again, these are the arguments that for some reason would never fly with cigarettes and tobacco, but get a free pass with marijuana. And really it's very sad. The other thing that we're hearing a lot about from the advocates is that, oh, we can reduce our opioid problem if we legalize marijuana. Um, and this is based on a faulty study from 11 years ago. Actually, that is not the case. First of all, updated studies, when you looked at the same data that showed that 11 years ago, the updated versions are showing actually that's not true. There was an increase in deaths. These are major journals, folks. This isn't some like blog by some teenager on the internet saying that it's okay. This is like Journal of the American Medical Association saying the opioid crisis appears to be worsening where marijuana has been legalized. And look at the Colorado opioid related overdose fatalities. They're not going down folks, they're going up. Um, and again, study after study, this was by Martins showing legalization appears to also be associated with increase in opioids. This was a study um, by, by Garfunkel and colleagues showing twice as many, uh, twice the risk, doubling the risk of opioid use when you use marijuana. And it didn't even, they substituted, they didn't, they didn't substitute marijuana. And regardless of their pain, I mean, even if they had a lot of pain, they weren't going to the marijuana over the opioids. They were sticking with the opioids. Uh, cannabis seldom serves as a substitute for non-medical opioids. Um, you don't believe in American research? How about Canadian, McMaster University? And this was during the, the big discussion about legalization in Canada. So this was not like at a time when this was popular to say. Canadian research, 3,600 people, marijuana did not lead to reducing opioid and actually hurt treatment admissions. The people, the people didn't stay longer in treatment because they were using marijuana, they stayed shorter. Um, another study, post-operative pain, um, they actually used more opioids per day when you were on marijuana. So folks, this is not helping our opioid crisis. We're also I saying- underscore, I don't mean to interrupt Dr. Sabet, but uh, even just one thing to point to, well, the, the lead Senator in Pennsylvania has pointed at how states that legalize marijuana, every, nearly every jurisdiction has seen opioid use go down. And, and so yeah. I guess just to underscore what you're pointing at, I know we, we go yeah. through there's lots of different studies. It's just not right. reality. Yeah. No, it's not. And again, it's not reality at all. Look, I mean, these studies are very clear. Look at Colorado. I mean, I challenge any state that since they legalized to see reduction in opioid. Reduction. And by the way, even if you saw that, there are a thousand reasons why that might be the case of the reduction. It's not necessarily just because they legalized marijuana. I mean, you have to look at, did they increase treatment? Did they increase buprenorphine? Did they increase, I mean, services? I mean, but, but, but anyway, you're not even seeing that anyhow. You're seeing increases. 
Um, certainly this year during the, the coronavirus pandemic, you're seeing huge increases. So it, it actually, it'll be good to look at the data from 2020 when we get it, because it, I guarantee you it will show increases in every single state, regardless of marijuana being legalized. We also see this industry now is very explicitly targeting our young people. And we need to realize that we shouldn't be surprised at this because of course, this is what the tobacco industry did for decades. Um, they're appealing to the sort of the snob appeal. You know, LA is full of brilliant people. We deliver them pot. Happiness, um, this is what it equals. Appealing to young people, you know, again, Th this is what this is their mo um they're returning animals that look like joe camel even i mean it you can't make this stuff up this is like the worst nightmare of what we predicted when we started sam eight years ago which was started a month and a half or two months after legalization in colorado was passed and washington state this is exactly what's happened we're now seeing companies like vape companies thc vape companies advertise on social media with cartoon characters targeted at Comic-Con. Uh, we are just seeing, you know, all of these issues happen. Um, and let me tell you why this is important for young people. It's important because when you look at addictive industries, folks, it's not the occasional users that make up the majority of the sales. It's actually the people who are having a huge problem with their substance, like alcohol. 10% of Americans make up 75% of alcohol industries, US sales. It is the exact same thing with marijuana. It's about 87% of marijuana is consumed by 30% of people. Um, it's the point is it's a small number of people who consume a large amount of the product. What does that mean? It means that these industries thrive off addiction. They need these people who use their product every day. This is part of the business plan because folks, this is about money. Money, money, money. You're wondering, how could this be if all the science is saying that? The science is being ignored and the companies are looking to get rich. You know, some states think they can make money, but I'll be showing you that never happens ever. Um, but, but, but the companies, that does happen. They do make money. Some of them do make money. This is having a very big impact on our public health generally. We're seeing huge increases in marijuana poisonings among zero to nine-year-olds. We're seeing, this is just Colorado only folks, tens of thousands of homes with children not storing marijuana products safely, tens of thousands of homes where children age one to 14 are exposed to secondhand smoke. The rate of children five and younger exposed to marijuana because they're grabbing these edibles, 75% of them it's accidental. You know, the 25% that's not accidental, by the way, might be parents introducing it to kids, which is incredible to think about. Um, but but most of them are because a kid sees an edible. I mean, anybody with small children, you know, you know what happens. They grab those, those, those good-looking candies. Um, and also, when you have a marijuana store in a community, that increases the likelihood of youth use and increases favorable opinions of marijuana. Okay, so when you have stores near you, it is normalized in your life. Period. And um, I will say I'm very proud that in every state that's legalized, we have worked to ban marijuana from the majority of states and localities. So that's really, really important to know um, from localities, not state, in localities. So 80% of California does not allow pot shops. We're gonna keep doing that in different states. But again, back to public health, marijuana hospitalizations surging in legal states. This is a really bad idea in the heart of the coronavirus pandemic when hospitals are apparently to the brink. The idea that you would increase problems there is I think very worrisome. Um, the national government, the federal government looked at national versus Colorado rates of marijuana and substance use disorders and mental illness. Surprise, surprise, more marijuana use in Colorado, way more mental illness, not very surprising. And again, this vaping crisis, um, part of it is because big tobacco has essentially taken over the marijuana industry, folks. This is not about mom and pop making a little money on Main Street with their cute little pot shop selling homemade brownies. <laughs> that is not what this is about. This is about major tobacco companies like Marlboro and others, or Altria, which makes Marlboro, and others coming in. And the vaping industry is totally interlocked with the marijuana industry. And I'm not gonna go into details on why, but we actually have a nice little graph here that shows that if you wanna look at it later. The PowerPoint will be available. I'm happy to make sure this is shareable afterwards. 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, mar the marijuana vapes were a huge part of this crisis. Let's talk about tax revenue a little bit because you know, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions. You know, the argument is that if we legalize marijuana, we can tax it, we can make a lot of money, and that's great for the state. Well, first of all, I think we all know we don't make money from alcohol and tobacco. Uh, why would we make money from marijuana revenue? Every dollar in alcohol tax, we spend 10 in social costs related to alcohol and tobacco. Marijuana is not different, but first of all, the revenue for marijuana is nowhere near the projections ever. It is less than 1% of state budgets in legal states, folks. This isn't funding your roads and your schools and your, you know, all these programs that it promises to fund. Um, it's it's not at all. And so, and by and, and and on top of this, the costs associated. This doesn't even take into account the cost. Can you imagine having a business that said, you know, we're a very successful business. We only count the revenues. <laughs> We don't, we don't, it's profit doesn't matter. We don't count the costs. I mean, that's what we're hearing from people. Um, but in reality, it is a drop in the bucket because, and on top of the drop in the bucket, there are these huge costs. One of the big costs is driving, impaired driving. Marijuana is specifically connected to impaired driving. It about doubles your risk of a car crash and fatalities have gone up in places like Colorado, other states like Washington as well. And again, I always tell people, don't take my word for it. See what you know, AAA says. AAA opposes recreational marijuana legalization because of its traffic safety risks and the difficulties in writing legislation that protects the public and treats drivers fairly. You just, it's a very, very bad idea. Um, and again, Washington State and Colorado more than doubled. Oregon, 50% of drivers tested positive for marijuana impairment after legalization. In Washington, one in five drivers are stoned. It used to be one in 10. Two thirds of people said that they didn't think it impaired their driving. I mean, we're doing a terrible job educating the American public on this issue uh, because we're so focused on let's legalize, let's legalize. In fact, a JAMA internal medicine study found that federal legalization would bring 7,000 more stone driving deaths nationally, 7,000 more every year and and maybe probably more. I think that's actually an undercount. So let's really look at this. Now you might be thinking, isn't this inevitable though? You know, isn't this just, um, I was just gonna grab something. Isn't this just uh, everybody wants it? And re in reality, when you give voters options, they prefer other things. They prefer medical, decrim or keeping it illegal versus the legalization. When you just say legalize, yes or no, yeah, 60% say legalize because they think of medical marijuana, they think of decriminalization, they don't want to put people in prison. And by the way, we don't want to put people in prison for low level amounts either. We don't want to give them criminal records. But it is a false dichotomy to say you either have to legalize or criminalize. That's a false dichotomy. And when we've done polls and other people have done polls like Emerson College, they have found exactly this. In fact, it made the Washington Post, which isn't necessarily going to be the friendliest newspaper on marijuana. They said you know, what voters really mean when they say they support marijuana legalization. That's really, really important to understand. Um, I want to talk about some federal legislation that we're watching that you might have heard of. Uh, safe banking more in states. So the MORE Act would fully legalize marijuana products at the federal level by removing marijuana from federal law. It gives businesses and corporate holding companies full access to investors and markets. It allows marijuana businesses to get loans from the Small Business Administration, and it allows them to de deduct the cost of advertising, which is really horrible. Um, this is like a, a, this would be really bad. Uh, if they could de deduct advertising, they would advertise more. And, um, you know, unfortunately, this is moving its way through the Senate. Now, you know, again, I think um, we have heard, uh, you know, f there'd be pushback. I think there is pushback on both sides of the aisle. So I do not think it will pass, even though some people think it will pass. Um, I think that there is pushback from Democrats as well as most Republicans. We need to keep the pressure on. The Safe Banking Act is sometimes seen as like the middle ground between current law and legalization because it would just allow banks the point is, folks, it's not about banks here. It's about allowing these massive investors to get their hands on investing legally into marijuana. This is a big problem. This would just open up the market in such a huge way that it really is something that we should not be passing at all. And then there's the States Act, which just would amend it to allow state law 
Um, but it would also fully legalize marijuana products at the federal level. So this idea that it's states' rights only is actually not the case. Um, again, it has a lot of the problems with the Moore Act. It's just by a different name. It is something absolutely to oppose. What are some policy solutions? Well, if you've legalized like New York just did, obviously we don't just go home you know, and forget about it. We have to restrict edibles and THC. We have to make sure the industry doesn't serve on rulemaking bodies. We have to make sure advertising and promotions are prohibited. We have to have an awareness campaign. Drug driving has to be a priority. But by the way, none of this is ever implemented, basically. I mean, Vermont did a potency cap, but it's not that great. It's better than nothing, but it's still really high. We are trying to work with some states on potency caps, but folks, this is a very difficult thing to do once you've let, um, you know, when, once the horse is out of the barn there. Um, in states that have not legalized, we don't want there to be criminal penalties. That's fine. Let's remove those. But we need to discourage the use of marijuana, not not encourage it. Uh, and again, when people say, well, that doesn't work, I mean, why do we have speed limits, right? Plenty of people drive 15 miles over the speed limit. I know that. I, you know, I, I would lie if I said I never drove over 55, you know, on the turnpike. Um, but, but I have. And thankfully, nothing happened when I drove, you know, 60 or whatever. But just because nothing happened to those people doesn't mean that we would get rid of speed limits because speed limits are meant to deter unsafe driving, which they do. Most people usually drive within the speed limit. It's the same thing with things like marijuana laws. There's a reason you have it. You want to discourage it. It doesn't mean you think everyone's always going to abide by it. I mean, you want them to, but they may not. But th that's not a reason to get rid of it. It's a reason. It's a part of discouraging and a science-based public awareness campaign that is implemented across media and of course, drug driving again. We have an entire report that's updated on our website called Lessons Learned, which you can get. Uh, and um, uh, it's for free, it's on our website. If you'd like to donate to us, awesome. Um, but we do offer this for free. And I wanted to talk a little bit, I wanted to end this with a little bit about my book. Uh, smoke screen. So I wrote, uh, my first book was called Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. I wrote that very quickly when I left the White House because I had all the facts and figures. I thought it wasn't getting out there. I was finally free from you know, the chains of the federal government. So I decided to sort of, you know, get this as fast as I could. And that was eight years ago. This book was a very different process for me. This was a process where about a couple of years ago, people started approaching me from different states who had either regulated marijuana, like they were state employees. So they were very, you know, uh, uh, courageous to approach me with their stories. People, parents and kids with horror stories related to addiction, marijuana addiction. Um, I had people who owned laboratories that were supposed to, you know, test marijuana to make sure it was safe to be sold legally. Basically at around that time, a couple of years ago, all these people approached me and said, I have a story to tell and I'm willing to come out. Either they've retired or they quit or whatever. So they, they, they were okay. I had somebody who worked in the largest marijuana company in Massachusetts um, talk about her experiences as an employee. So I said, I have to write a book about this. And what I learned, even though I've been doing this every day, really for the last decade, what I learned what just astounded me. And I really thought this is what the marijuana industry does not want the American people to know, because if they knew about the kinds of things that I reported in the book, which, for example, my prologue, I talk about how this is affecting a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, and it's not because they're using marijuana, and I, I don't, I'm not going to give it away here. Part of this is I want to just talk a little bit about it, hopefully intrigue you enough to buy the book, but, you know, the issue is these are fi a five-year-old and seven-year-old being exposed um, by one of their parents to the market of legal marijuana and nobody was doing anything about it. This was reported to the authorities and nobody was doing anything about it. It's incredible. Um, by the way, kids are being exposed every day in New York City public housing. There was a study recently showing, you know, a huge problem of, um, of marijuana traveling down staircases and elevators in the hallway, in the lobbies. It's a very, very big issue in public housing. Um, and that's not to stigmatize or target one group, but it shows that you know this is a very big issue and kids are being expo exposed and exploited. The other thing that happened is I had people come up to me who used to be big players in the marijuana industry, whether they were lobbyists or company folks, and they had really big regrets. They saw what was going on. They saw the corporatization and commercialization and they were really upset about it and they wanted to tell their story. So I talked with a few of them in the book um, I talk with these whistleblowers. I talk with people who 
told me that, you know, they were essentially run out of business in terms of their lab because they wouldn't fake the results. Um, I talked to um, people who regulated marijuana and tried to do the right thing. Like they didn't really have an opinion about legalization. Maybe they were, one of them was actually against it. One of them was for it. So I had two people and the one, both of them had the same conclusion, which was that this, they were not able to regulate marijuana. Um, they were told by their political, you know, bosses, they were told by other people, you can't really do this, you need to just kind of, you know, check the box nine to five, don't think about it too much and move on. And the stories they told really showed the perilousness to public health, the pesticides, the molds, the kinds of things that are in these products, which we've been seeing studies about, but hearing firsthand was really, really uh, incredible. I talk about the industry capture, so I can go into more detail about who is the marijuana industry? Where are they coming from? It will surprise you to see some of the well-known names that are in the marijuana industry, maybe. It will surprise you to see how there are close family relations with sponsors of bills and people who are related to the industry and making money from it. Um, so I talk about that. Um, I, I talk about the issue of social justice and, and chapter nine is called Perpetuating Social Injustice, where um, you know, there are people fighting this successfully on the local level um, and doing so with the facts, with science. So it almost offers a blueprint to be able to do that and what they did to change minds. Um, by the way, you know, this idea on social justice, I think we should talk about for a minute, the idea that if we only treated it like alcohol, it would be better for social justice. I'm not sure people realize that we have one and a half million people a year arrested for alcohol related violations in this country. Just because something's legal doesn't mean we don't arrest you for it. In fact, we arrest you more for it because more people use. So from a percentage point of view, from a society point of view, the, the numbers, there are more people arrested when something is legal because they're, they're, they're going to be violating rules. You can't use in public. You can't use and drive. You can't sell to kids. There are, there are rules associated with it. Um, there are still disproportionate arrests. You go to Colorado, there are still twice as many people arrested for marijuana violations than for, 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 for than white people. In fact, Hispanic and Asian arrests have gone up within the same period. Um, it has not reduced prison populations, folks. In fact, it's, there have been an increase in prison populations in many places. So if you look at legalization now, different states are taking measures to try and reduce prison population, but that has nothing to do with marijuana. Um, for example, in Alaska and DC, there was a reduction because of something else. Then legalization came and there was actually an increase. Colorado, there was a reduction. And then when they legalized, there was actually an increase. So we are not seeing um, these reductions. We're seeing public use. When you say on, when we say on view, that means public use of marijuana, those violations have gone up. So, so this idea that you know, we are able to, you know, somehow miraculously fix the criminal justice system if you legalize marijuana is wrong. And by the way, guess who's making money from legal pot? It is not the corner boy. It is not the kid in the inner city. It is these um, major big companies and they're not led by, by, by black men. I can just tell you that right now or women, period. Um, and even though the states have diversity efforts, like they put in tons of money to say, we'll give you first license, we'll give you, it doesn't matter. They don't have the access to the capital. They can't compete against these massive companies. Look at all, I mean, when you have Vice, who's, you know, major leadership of Vice Media all loves marijuana, when they write stories, then you, you know something is really wrong. Um, white weed entrepreneurs are gaming programs to help people of color. Why isn't marijuana legalization doing any good for people of color? All of these haven't happened. And every state says they can do it better. I mean, in New York, it's like, we're the best. We can do it right. I, you know, okay, well, today was day one. So we're going to reserve judgment, but we've never seen this happen. In fact, in Illinois, it was promised and it has been a colossal failure. Fewer than 20% of all businesses are owned by minorities. Fewer than 4% are owned by African-Americans. And when you look at communities of color, when you look at some of these low income communities, that is where the concentration of marijuana stores is. So, you know, they not only don't benefit from the you know little bit of money you might make as an individual, they, they don't do that. They also have a huge influx of pot shops in these communities. 
Uh, and that's something that we rarely talk about, but it's important to know because where are the liquor stores in our communities? Are they in upper class communities? Usually not. Um, and then I also talk in the book about the marijuana underground because there's this idea that you get rid of the drug dealers if you legalize marijuana, like we'll legitimize them, we'll get rid of them. Listen, drug dealers don't just you know go become saints after you legalize drugs, folks. There's a lot of other things that many of them are involved in, um, you know. And I actually interviewed a drug dealer in a legal state who is making more money now than she ever did when it wasn't legal. So legal legalization allows dealers to hide under the premise of legality. You know, they're, they're growing all these plants or doing all these things. They're saying, hey, I'm allowed to do that. It's legal. You don't know that I'm selling it. Uh, and, and they're really getting away with it. I mean, the New York Times wrote a story, getting worse, not better. Illegal pop market booming in California despite legalization. So folks, it's very clear what is happening. And by the way, the drug cartels are not just drug cartels. They're diversified enterprises. They include pirated goods, logging, mining, all kinds of things. The idea that they're just going to go away uh, isn't going to happen. And look at the illicit market for tobacco. We have a half trillion dollar business, more than that, for tobacco underground. Um, you look at various states, they're not able to sell most of their product legally, and most of it's sold illegally. But yet they say that it's a huge success. Um, I also talk a little bit about my story, why I'm involved in this, and then also my experiences in the White House, specifically in the Obama administration, kind of what the thinking was in there and what happened when I was there. So um, if you are interested, you could pre-order the book, smokescreenbook.com. If you could leave a review on Goodreads, as well as after 420 on Amazon, I would really, really appreciate it. I think you can leave it on Goodreads very soon, but on Amazon, you have to wait till the book comes out on April 20th. Um, and again, our SAM Summit, Brendan at learnaboutsam.org for registration info, and our website, which is learnaboutsam.org, um, and email address, info at learnaboutsam.org. Uh, you, can, you can contact us there. So really, really appreciate this. I wanted to make sure I had plenty of time to get into to a, to a discussion and answer any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sabat. And, and, and there's so many elements to this issue and you do such a great job of really covering many of those. And I, and I will uh, give a shout out to the, the book. Um, Thank you. Smokescreenbook.com. I've, I've read, I'm about middle way through, uh, still getting through, but it is an excellent blend of the needed evidence and data and studies, but also the talking with the people that are being impacted by this and yeah. the stories and the interviews that you have. It's just such a great blend. I would say it's a must read. Please go out and purchase pre-order this book. So at this time, I think what we want, yeah, we want to dive into a discussion. If you have some questions, those that are, are live right now, feel free to use the Q&A uh, uh, box to submit some questions. We had many submitted that we'll try to cover as many as we can. Uh, one that I wanted to get to is uh, in reading your book, the, the very first thing I read, the first line, it struck me. It was the dedication of the book. You said you, you dedicate this to all those you've met who are affected with addiction. And that really stands out to me, especially in our state in Pennsylvania. I always remember back last September, Governor Wolf at one of his many press conferences to support the full on legalization of this drug said, I'm not sure how anybody would see marijuana as something that is addictive. Yeah. And it's always struck me because the reality of today's high potent marijuana is the fact that we are seeing the addiction rates. And so I guess, how would you respond somewhat to that question, uh, the, the statement yeah. that Governor Wolf posed? but also why you chose to dedicate the book to those that are affected with, addi with addiction. You know, I have met so um, uh, many people who have been affected and they, you know, one of the, the chapters, in fact, I have multiple chapters, one of them, multiple of them relate to those who are affected, to the parents, to people like Sally Shindell, who basically, um, you know, uh, had to bury her son, Andy, who died by suicide because of high potency marijuana uh, abuse um, and, you know, had his suicide note. Uh, and in fact, maybe what I can do is, if it's okay with you, I have to, of course, get it, is um, play, I actually talk a little bit about her uh, in my, um, in my, uh, the promo, the, the video that talks a little bit about the book. So maybe after the Q and A or in between or something, I'll, I'll play it. And we, and I talk a little bit about that, but yeah, no, it's, I did that because it, that, that it's, it's everyone who's affected and I, people don't realize there are real victims. And that's why I think anything that we can do in Pennsylvania 
um, to highlight those stories and bring those people to Harrisburg, frankly, and show leadership. I'm the one affected by, by your rhetoric and by your words. I'm hurt by your words, governor, lieutenant governor, because we are affected. And what are we going to do to protect, you know, to uh, people so that this doesn't happen to them in the future? Um, you know, I, I'm going to say this without, you know, at this point, I, I, I'm not, yeah, I, I think I can be an open book about this. I, I might've told Dan this before. I think I did, Dan, you know, I ran into Governor Wolf about a year and a half ago in a <laughs> sort of a small resort outside of Pennsylvania. My wife and I were on a little baby moon for before we had our child for, for two days. And we just, I mean, there was like no one around. I mean, honestly, even in this hotel resort, which isn't very big there, we didn't see that many people. And one day um, while we were there, my wife and I were, re they had a library, really nice library. We were reading and hanging out because it was kind of cold outside. And I look to my right and I see somebody that looks very familiar. And, you know, Tom Wolf is kind of an understated guy. He, he, you know, he's not like when Andrew Cuomo walks in the room or Gavin Newsom. I mean, he's just different. He's more understated, I, I think. I mean, you guys know better, but, um, and, you know, without his suit on and stuff, I mean, he just looks like a sort of regular guy. And I thought, that guy looks really familiar. I'm not sure who it is, but boy, and I follow politics and I didn't recognize him right off the bat. Then I said, wait a minute, I do know who that is. That is the governor of Pennsylvania. I think, and I kind of looked at him again and he kind of looked at me and I realized it was him. And I thought that's, and then he went away. And I thought to myself, you know, if I see him again, I know this issue was bubbling up because Fetterman had just started kind of this rhetoric on this. Maybe it was two years ago. And I said to myself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to him about this. This is a golden opportunity. So lo and behold, we were actually um, in a very small elevator together for like five minutes. And because um, there were some issues with the elevator, we weren't stuck, but it was like going to the wrong floor. And anyway, it was lucky for me. Maybe it was divine intervention. I don't know. But basically, I said, this is my chance. And I said, you know, Governor, um, you know, thank you for serving the Commonwealth. And my, we, my parents live in Pennsylvania and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, you know, that the marijuana issue, I started this, this thing with Patrick Kennedy. The marijuana issue is really, you know, something that's been that's been discussed lately. And I'm really concerned and about, about the legalization and commercialization. And the first thing he said is, oh, you should talk to John about that, meaning I later realized, meaning Fetterman. And I said, yeah, I said, I, that's fine. But I, I don't know if, you know, I think he, I would really like it if he heard the science on this. And, and, and what he basically said at that point, the governor, this was before he came out in favor. He just said, you know what? He basically said, I don't care about it either way. Like, I don't really have an opinion. I haven't thought about it. It's not an issue. I have other issues to think about, which, which frankly is probably what most Pennsylvanians feel. Like, this is not an issue that they want anyone to be focused on. This is not something that's going to bring out voters. This is not something that's going to, you know, it's not going to, it's just, it's not a top 50, 20, 30 issue. It's not the economy, jobs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, he just kind of said that. And then he said, you know what, talk to my policy person. And he gave me a name of someone who unfortunately never replied to me. But he really just didn't care. And I even think he said something about the edibles, something negative about marijuana. And then he followed that up by saying, you know, but I heard in Colorado, you know, haven't they been able to, to sort of not have the dealers? And I said, no, 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 they're still there. And he said, oh, he was much more open-minded. It was just very, a very interesting, very rare encounter but it's very clear to me that it, it's just probably this kind of thing where the advisors are like, listen, everybody wants it in Pennsylvania. Fetterman's making you look bad with young people. Just, just, it's just like, who cares? Just be in favor of it. That's what I, that's what I, that's my sense. I don't get the sense at least I'm like, I, I think him and Fetterman come from a very different place on this. I mean, Fetterman, like you know, his wife is a known you know, medical user. And like, there's a, there's a whole like culture there. Whereas I don't think that's the case with, 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 with the governor. Um, but again, my point of saying all this is that we need to keep pressing these issues and bringing people and showing these stories. Cause there are many of them uh, and, and talking about why this would be really bad for the kids of, of, of Pennsylvania. I'd underscore uh... I know, and, and I don't want to give too much away from your book, um, but the, no, the mother that you referenced and, and her son, Adam, that, that um, yeah. you know, essentially what she says, marijuana killed him. Uh, yes. And the, uh, the statement that uh, the coroner came and, and she was asking about testing marijuana and the coroner saying marijuana doesn't cause an overdose death. Right. And I guess how, how I, I, I can understand, and you talked about it in your presentation, you know, the 99% THC products that are really just coming now 
more into today's market. How is that going to influence, how should it influence our attitudes towards marijuana because of what we're seeing with the rise in addictions and the, the mental illness? You know, I, I guess people that just say, eh, it doesn't, you know, Fetterman's tour, I heard that all the time. Not one person's yeah. died from this, from an overdose. Yeah. And it's, how should that 99% THC especially change our mentality? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, no, no one's died from a tobacco overdose either. Does that mean that tobacco doesn't kill? No. Um, and by the way, death isn't the only thing we're concerned about. We should also be concerned if kids are dropping out of school. We should also be concerned if that reduces your IQ, increases mental illness by you know five times the increase of psychosis and schizophrenia. We should also be concerned if it causes workplace accidents. There's a huge, huge issues with workplace safety. Um, so it's not just about death. I mean, that's not the only outcome we care about. We want you to live a life worth living. I mean, living a life worth living means that you're not that you're in recovery, that you're not addicted to drugs. And um, we do know it's addictive. That, that saying it's not addictive is saying that the earth is flat. I mean, it's just there is absolutely no evidence. The evidence is overwhelming that it's addictive. Again, this study that just came out, I think I heard somebody, I saw, I saw someone say, um, you know, something about, let me see, it was in the Q&A here. Um, uh, maybe it's gone now, but it was about that study. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that, um, uh, yeah, oh, the link, yes, the link to NIDA. And so, yeah, I think that that's, I think that's really, uh, I think that's really, really important to talk about that, you know, those, those studies for sure. And we'll look to follow up with folks on this call and sure. again, description of this video, we'll have a lot of resources to provide. So to get to some of the uh, submitted questions, there was one uh, asking what method exists to objectively measure the intoxicating amount of THC for driving or operating equipment? I know that's yeah. New York, a lot of centers we are have to point that out, but. Yeah. They were very upset about that. We have no method to determine exact impairment. So let me be very clear. We can determine with marijuana metabolites are in your system, probably even if it was recent use. But this idea that we're going to have some cutoff like 0.08 with alcohol, it will be a made up number because every it affects everybody differently. I never think we're going to get to a number that says this is a cutoff. Maybe we'll just do a political compromise and say we're going to make whatever a cutoff and just you know, it's a political compromise, not a scientific one, because we don't have a scientific number. Um, if, actually, studies show that any amount can be impairing, and they show that it stays in your system long enough, not only like, oh, it stays in your system, and you're not impaired, but it's going to say you're impaired. No, it stays in your system, and you're impaired long term. I mean, this is the thing, people think you're not impaired uh, long term, but there are studies showing that even when you think you're not impaired, you actually are. And so, um, uh, you know, that is a huge, huge issue that people, um, that people have, that they don't realize that you actually are still impaired even after you feel like you're not impaired. And I think it underscores why so many in law enforcement sheriff mm -hmm. associations are opposed to this because of that. Thing. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So another, I know a popular kind of argument that comes up in this debate is smoking marijuana is less dangerous than using alcohol. Yeah. Use. So we had some folks asking, how would you respond? Kind of that question, you know, people that are having alcohol, a couple of drinks a day, what's the harm in that? And, and yeah. comparing that to marijuana. I know you talked a little bit about it, but again, just yeah. addressing that. Point. Well, first of all, alcohol from a societal point of view has been an unmitigated disaster. Um, alcohol kills 100,000 people a year. It costs more to society than all drugs combined. It is much more deadly from a societal point of view than the drug like heroin, which kills far fewer people. Um, the idea that alcohol is a model to me is like saying my headlights are broken, so let's break the taillights just to be consistent. I mean, it, we don't wanna be consistent with something that's bad. Um, that being said, alcohol is legal, not because it's good for you. Alcohol is legal because of its cultural stance in, our, in Western civilization for the last 5,000 years. It's been used by the majority of Western inhabitants for thousands of years. We're stuck with it. I mean, it's very difficult. We're, we're stuck with it. And, it. and by the way, you do not only drink to get drunk. The only reason you use THC is to change your state of mind, um, to feel very intoxicated. Whereas with alcohol, it's different. We also know that alcohol is less addictive, especially for young people, according to this new research that's come out. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, I get it. People want to have a drink after work. And why is this different? And if you have a joint after work, by the way, this isn't even about a joint after work or not. I mean, I, 
you know, this is about the mass commercialization of marijuana. Obviously, I think people shouldn't use, but I'm not as concerned if a 60 year old guy, you know, smokes a joint and falls asleep on his couch afterwards and doesn't drive or doesn't have kids to take care of and can just move on. But this is very different than commercializing marijuana on mass. And so there are differences. Alcohol, by the way, is in and out of your system in 24 hours. Marijuana stays longer, which means, um, you know, uh, uh, which means that it's important to understand that it, 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 um, it can have the, the effects can last longer. And, and by the way, I'm not, and I see this chat, I'm not saying how or why people should use. We're saying people should be informed and people are very misinformed. They think it's safe. They think it's okay. Does that mean that every user is going to have an addiction or go on to use cocaine? No, of course not. But it means what do we want as a policy in society? That's the issue. Do we want a policy that encourages and commercializes 99% marijuana, which is what these states are passing? Or do we want a policy that discourages, doesn't put people in prison for using, but generally tries to discourage the use because of the harms, not just to yourself, but of course to other people? Long kind of pointing again, the harms. Uh, I know one submitted question was talking about how can you quantify it? Is, you know, are there statistical evidence? Is the data? And I know we've talked, you know, about this too, but just, you know, what could you point to folks in terms of calculating those adverse financial impacts that full well, legalization there, brings? Yeah, there are some, um, uh, there are some uh, studies, for example, um, there's a study which we can send around that shows that for every dollar in revenue, it costs $4.50 in costs. Um, there are, of course, studies with other drugs showing that the revenue never makes up for it, and the revenue is always a drop in the bucket. So if someone asked, how does this work out in the States? It's less than 1% of the total revenue. So um, it's a very, very small number. Um, and again, there are these huge costs as well. Even along those lines, uh, Margie submitted a, a question, auto insurance rates. Have you seen, are there, are yes. there increases in- We have states? seen, yes, we have seen auto insurance rates go up. Um, there, there's some data on that, but yes, we have. That's been, that's, that's a, been a very big issue. I know uh, some others just getting to, and, and again, it just uh, underscores the, the, the many types of issues that this gets into and, and, and underscores, I think, again, folks wanting to dive into this book of yours. And, and I would, uh, again, recommend wholeheartedly purchasing this book. Thank um, you. One thing is, is just related to, to children. I, I think, obviously, with minors looking at this, uh, you know, the pro-marijuana lobby will point to how this policy to regulate is, is for ages 21 and up. And, you know, if we, we need to regulate it so we keep it out of the hands of kids. And it seems like we're not seeing that in states that do legalize. And, and yeah. I guess, could you speak more to that? I know there's been some rise in, in youth use. Uh, obviously, we're seeing that just in general, more using. But can you point to states specifically that have legalized that we've seen more harms on minors, more harms on children? Yeah, no, I mean, specifically look at Colorado, look at Washington. I mean, honestly, all the states, we have seen these very, very big increases in, um, in, 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 that, in, in problems related to, especially small children, again, zero to nine-year-olds getting edibles, going to the hospital. So we've seen emergency room admissions. We've seen youth use. There was a study a couple of weeks ago showing California increased youth use after legalization. There are studies in other states showing that. All of this is in our impact report on our website. There is more there than I can remember, and there's more there than you'll want to know, and it's, it's available for you for free. It's also an appendix if you want the printed version. It's, an append, it's the appendix in the book, so that's kind of a cool, um, you know, uh, 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 addition. And again, underscores, yeah, that's why I appreciate the book. It, it brings that data, brings those studies, um, but also has the ability to talk with people that this is being impacted by. Um, one thing, even yes. just along those lines, I, I think to underscore, you often use the term marijuana commercialization. You know, we yeah. hear a lot in this issue of marijuana legalization or cannabis yeah. even legalization. But why is the better term commercialization? Almost getting it in people's minds that aren't in a state that has legalized this. Yeah. What does commercialization look like? 
Well, I think it's commercialization because it's not just about legalization. It's not just about you can use it if you're an adult. It's about commercializing, promoting, and normalizing. And what commercialization looks like is the advertising, the pushing uh, social and social media, which if you look, is just everywhere flooded with marijuana and other drug issues. Um, it is this idea of a commercial industry pushing this. It's a for-profit private industry pushing the legalization of marijuana. Uh, and as we one fallout, I guess, with the uh, the commercialization of it, um, you know, what do you see with regards to, I know you brought up AAA, uh, kind of the DUIs, um, road safety. I think it's been something that's tried to be pushing back on states that legalize. Uh, but the fact is they're seeing more, more accidents, more harm on the roads. Um, just speaking to that end, I think someone asked about that. Yeah, no, the driving issue is huge. Um, we've seen a doubling in risk of a uh, crash if you're intoxicated on, on THC. Uh, we've seen an increase in recent use, recent use marijuana if you have um, if you have crashes. If, for people that, that have been involved in crashes, the increase in recent users of marijuana has gone up uh, in various states like Colorado and Washington. It's why the AAA opposes it. Um, I think the driving issue is really big. I think we're going to be, so, and it's not just driving, it's trains as well. I mean, look at the Pennsylvania Amtrak accident, Philadelphia. Guess what? The conductor had in his system. Um, we, we have been seeing this time and time again. And that I think is one of the biggest harms we need to, we need to, um, we need to, we need to encounter. I, I love challenging questions in, tr in terms of, um, and by the way, you know, if you don't believe me on the stats, don't take my word for it. Talk to AAA talk to the law enforcement agencies that record the numbers and, and you'll see them yourself. And this is what I even tell the young people. I say, I, don't take my word for it. Look at the primary sources yourself, peer reviewed journals, look at um, you know uh, uh, the actual primary statistics of where they come from and then make the determination yourself. You shouldn't take anybody's word for it at all. The other um, thing I, I again, I, I love taking these questions is someone said, well, it's human nature to overindulge in things they like. Yeah, that's called addiction. When you overindulge in a certain way, obviously it's not all addiction, um, but you can. Uh, you know, running and, and Twinkies is different than an intoxicating substance that alters your mind, um, that, that actually may, for, often forces you to make a really bad decision. So I take offense because I have talked to so many of these victims and people can doubt them if they want. They're in the book, there are statistics out there. Um, of people who have been affected, who did fall because of their addiction, who did have their lives taken away from them, even if they're still alive, their life is 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 not what it used to be because of this addiction. And that's not like Twinkies or or plastic surgery or something. Um, it's something that that it has um, ruined. Does that mean we want to put someone in prison because they've used marijuana and and use those resources? No. But why does there need to be that false dichotomy of either prison? or encouraging use and allowing use. It's, it, there is a middle ground there, folks. And I don't, this is not about a 60 year old adult choosing cannabis. This is not, that's not what this is about. This is about the mass increase of commercialization, the promotion for profit interests that are essentially duping the American people again. That's the issue I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. I think sticking on, on this topic with addiction, I know that there was a question, Jennifer asking any advice for those who yeah. work in addiction prevention and how we can respond to what's happening. Yeah. And, well, and there are a lot of things. You can do webinars like this. Uh, we do these, they're available. You can do um, uh, town halls. You can get the information out, cable access television, talk to your local elected officials as well, because you are the, uh, you are the people that are um, closest to the ground and to the, you know, to the issue. So I would absolutely raise this issue right now while you can. Um, because it's, it's just really important. So I would emphasize people like to ignore marijuana, even in our field, because it's a harder drug to talk about than heroin or methamphetamine, which few people are saying we should legalize just yet. But by the way, that is coming next. I mean, side note, they are now legalizing mushrooms and hallucinogens all across the country in places that have legalized marijuana. So don't think that it just ends with marijuana. It doesn't. But still, generally, talking about legalizing heroin and meth is controversial. And so uh, it, it's easy for us as a field just to do that, as opposed to talk about, talk about this issue. And even just talking through recognizing that you know, 
people get addicted to marijuana. There's so many that don't have that. They have the view of yeah. even what marijuana used to be and that's not right. knowing anybody that's been addicted. I mean, I, I, there was a treatment center in Pennsylvania that I was on a debate with and highlighting how so many people coming into their treatment centers are addicted solely to marijuana. People yeah. don't know oh, yeah. that. And so no, speaking down don't. on that is needed. Um, they don't. Switching gears, they don't. another submitted question. I know we have some, some business owners uh, concerned with the liability protections for employers. So could you speak to the end of just in the workplace, what uh, happens in states that legalize how that impacts those liability protections for employers? Yeah, so I think employers are having are going to have a huge headache and hassle with this issue because of the increase in lawsuits and other problems. People are now saying, well, it's legal. You can't prove I just used it before I came to work. Maybe I used it on Sunday night. It's legal there. So how are you penalizing me for using something that I claim to and I have evidence or whatever that I use it on Sunday night? But then they get into an accident at work. It's a huge headache and liability. We are already seeing lawsuits. We are already seeing major issues here. So that is something I'm very concerned about. There are also issues with, with regards to heavy machinery and heavy equipment construction, where we're starting to see issues where they're saying, no, 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 it had nothing to do with marijuana. I had an accident because, you know, it was faulty equipment. And then the employer has to deal with it. It's a big problem. I, a couple of other questions, certainly, again, thank you so much for uh, sure. diving into this issue and, and the many that are watching, thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, connecting again, a group smart approaches to marijuana, uh, really leading the charge nationally. Uh, also, if you're in Pennsylvania, we certainly want to connect with you as well, organization Pennsylvania Family Institute. Uh, one other, I guess, looking, you know, the, sure. the, the somewhat science behind this, some are asking, what are the effects of long life use of marijuana, the, the lifelong use of this drug? Do we know some of the impacts that this is going to have on people that do that? Well, we do. Um, we're with the lifelong impacts. We have seen evidence of more, you know, dependence on social assistance, more likely to um, not have a stable family and more likely later in life to report less life satisfaction. I mean, that's an amazing stat because that means the person is admitting there's a problem there, which is very difficult for people to do. But when there have been big long term population studies asking people, you know, how satisfied are you with your life? Those that use marijuana marijuana controlled for everything else said they were much less satisfied. Obviously, the income issues, the lower IQ issues, a lot of these issues come with using a drug that essentially increases your, you know, desire to just kind of drop out of life. That's why I actually call marijuana not the deadly drug, I call it the dropout drug, because you're dropping out of life. That's what they that's what it does to you. That's what it can, can do to you. Not everybody. I'm not saying that everybody does that. I mean, frankly, you know, we've seen a lot of celebrities that are doing quite well for themselves embrace marijuana, although that's probably because that's being encouraged. And so they're being, you know, encouraged in that lifestyle. But the the, the, the bottom line is um, for a lot of people, that's not the case. For most people, it's not the case, especially those that don't have a lot of money. It, 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 I don't see how this is going to help people that start out with life given a bad hand. Um, we need to help lift them up, not keep them down with psychoactive substances. Couple more questions. Um, one, it gets into what you started out with, kind of talking about the the, the buckets that we see, kind of the, the medical use of marijuana, the decriminalization of this drug, and then really the full-on legalization, commercialization. I know some folks are, you know, with legalization, does it help those using marijuana for medical reasons? You know, almost the the reasons yeah. behind to legalize should be to help those from a medical standpoint. Yeah. Well, we don't legalize. Um, drugs from a pharmacy all just because to help them to help people with medical problems access it so that's never that's never something um that we would do and so I, I don't know why people think that we should legalize marijuana to help on the medical side if you want to help on the medical side we should do real research to actually get approved drugs through the scientific process and i, I know some people don't like the scientific process i know some people but, but let me tell you it's a much better process than politicians voting on whether a drug is good or bad can you imagine if politicians voted on whether the late whether the coronavirus vaccine was good or bad like voted on it no it has to go through scientific processes and, and those aren't perfect. They're sometimes subject to, you know, corruption. I get it, but they're much better. They have way more controls than just the whim of the people or the whim of legislators, elected officials, politicians. Mm -hmm. I think along those lines, I guess, bring up that other bucket with 
and then some of the decriminalization. Uh, you know, I think there are some that have submitted questions that recognize, you know, when you promote this measure for social justice, it's hurting the communities which you are trying to design to help. And, and so I guess speak to that. You, you brought about Illinois, uh, you know, some of it, but I guess speaking more to that element of the social justice that we need to legalize for social justice reasons. Yeah, well, the issue is um, we should do a lot of things for social justice reasons, but legalization would bring social injustice. Uh, our drug laws in terms of alcohol and tobacco that are legal, our legal drug laws hurt minority communities more than other communities because you have a congregation of stores, you have the community, you have this industry that really targets those that are most vulnerable. Why? Because you have fewer resources to get out of it. Uh, if you have a problem, whereas if I had a problem, I have a lot of resources, I have money, I can go to a treatment center, I know a lot of people, I mean, there, there's a lot, I can go get a job again, you know, but if you're, not, if you don't have those resources, you are much less likely to come out of it. And this industry knows it. Why in this country have we banned every flavor of cigarettes except menthol? <laughs> Who is menthol used by? By 98% the black community. There's a reason for that. These industries target the most vulnerable. And this idea that legalizing marijuana is going to help the most vulnerable is laughable. Well, again, uh, we uh, point to a new book coming out next month, Smoke Screen, uh, what the marijuana industry uh, doesn't want you to know. And, and so you can purchase it, smokescreenbook.com. Uh, also, I guess I'd bring up, there was a, a you know, this wasn't your first book. Um, no. you, know, you did write uh, something before, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and with that book, it was Reefer Sanity, Seven Myths. Yeah. Seven great myths about marijuana. What would you say is perhaps t today the greatest myth that you see? You, you've had many conversations on this issue with Boy. many different people. You know, what do you, you find, know, even in your experiences, I, is that that great yeah. myth or misconception? I wouldn't have said this um, maybe two years ago, but seeing how things are going, I would say the social justice myth because I mean, I even just got an email today. Uh, from a Democratic legislator in um, in uh, uh, New York, who said that I, you know, I learned so much from you all. Thank you. I voted no because basically I learned from you. And um, but what happened was the social justice part overrode everything else, and they they said that that's really what did it. And um, you know, even though they said the health stuff was all disregarded. Um, so I, that, that, that's probably what I would say. I know with the health, I know I can recall in, in reading your book, there was something you brought up about a staffer at Capitol Hill, congressional staffer that, you know, she suggested you're perfectly fine if a commercial airline pilot smokes a joint, you know, and, and before taking control in the, in the plane. Uh, I, I would hope many listening that would find problems, especially with today's marijuana, the potency that we see that there are certainly many harms with that idea. And, yes. and, and so again, uh, the many things that are being brought up, uh, they're part of this book, smokescreenbook.com. Uh, you can purchase uh, pre-order. I highly recommend it as a must read. I'm, I'm involved in it now. I will be finishing it soon. And it's just been a great resource to me. Uh, Dr. Sabet, you have been a Thanks, tremendous Dan. ally and friend and, and just Thank all you. the work that you guys are doing at SAM. I uh, highly recommend folks to, to dive into them if you're not familiar with their organization learn about sam.org is there should i go ahead and play that video maybe do we have a yeah, if you have, you have it there certain, certainly it's, you can it's, see if it's it'll two work. minutes yep. so maybe let me see i mean hopefully you'll and get as we're getting sound. it ready we'll also be posting yeah. this online i can i can also kind of edit in yeah. and do some things there as well Good. for folks so know that you'll be getting some follow-up resources and Great. this link to the presentation this is a book about the newest addiction for profit industry in america the untold story of big marijuana I'm bearing witness. I'm testifying to what I've heard from people all across the country. And it's not really about whether legalization is right or wrong or whether marijuana is even good or bad. It's about the biggest takeover of public health by corporate interests since the advent of big tobacco 100 years ago. Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. And I think it's time we hear the story. I've been really lucky to have served Presidents Clinton, Bush, Obama, uh, you know, to have debated heads of state, even U.S. presidential candidates uh, on this issue. 
but nothing could have prepared me for what I learned when I wrote this book. Right around the winter of 2018, I started hearing in succession from people all across the country about their experiences with this industry. People like Sarah talk about her lab that she was so proud of uh, that tested THC content and then falling very, very quickly in the reality of the industry not wanting the accurate tests, rather preferring to pay for tests that they wanted you know, to see, to get the results they wanted. Sally is a woman I've known for I don't know, almost a decade now, I think, and hearing her courage um, after she lost her son, Andy, who died by suicide. Uh, Andy hanged himself on a tree in his backyard and was somebody who um, had a whole life in front of him. Uh, his story is something that I never forget and his note that he left behind is something I carry around with me uh, almost everywhere I go in this journey. He wrote, I will only get worse. My soul is already dead. Marijuana killed my soul and ruined my brain. It's something that no, one, no parent can imagine having to go through. Uh, people like Senator Ron Rice of New Jersey, the head of the Black Caucus there, who worked very hard to delay legalization as much as he could. Um, these, are, these are the courageous stories I think that we need to hear. There's stories that we absolutely need to hear and that's where I, again, appreciate all the interviews and the time that was spent in, into this resource. Um, so please, Thank you. Folks, uh, you know, order this book, read this book, share this book. I'll also encourage folks in Pennsylvania, you know, we've been working with Smart Approaches to Marijuana uh, for so. several years now. And so trying to highlight needs to, to take action. And so please be in touch with your policymakers. You know, we're in a battle right now uh, to, you know, really, are we going to put on our next generation the commercial sale of a addictive mind altering drug for recreational purposes? And so trying to convey these truths to your elected officials is certainly needed. So we appreciate, you know, communications with your state senator, state representative, elected officials, even like Governor Wolf, you know, being able to, to influence you know, just their decision making. So uh, you, please connect with us, Pennsylvania Family Institute, pafamily.org. Uh, and uh, we'd be happy to connect with you more in how we can go about that. But again, Dr. Spett, I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for all the time you've spent with us and devoting on this issue. It's, I'm, I'm glad you're in, in our fight and, and all the work that you're doing. Just a great job, you and your team. Well, thank you. Thank you to you and your team. Thanks for having me. We're happy to be partners and we will be moving forward uh, in Pennsylvania. This will be a huge priority for us and, it's, and it is now. So thank you. All right. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. You too. God bless. Thanks.